Hi, welcome. Today we're going to talk about the types of assessment and we're going to talk about a lot of vocabulary today. So the first thing, types of assessment. So the first one we'll talk about is norm referenced versus criterion referenced assessments. So norm reference assessments talks about the relative performance of a student um, to a group versus a criterion referenced, which is um, based upon a set of objectives. Um, so most of what we do in school are criterion referenced. So examples of norm reference would be grading on a curve, percentile ranking um, versus criterion referenced or standards based. So when you see things like an IQ test or you are the 95th percentile, that would be norm referenced. Criterion referenced is pretty much everything else in school. So when you get 95% correct on a test, that's criterion referenced. You can see that normal curve distribution at the bottom of the screen there, and that's a norm reference test. Um, there's some really important differences between norm reference and criterion reference test. So norm reference tests tend to create tend to cover a large amount of content with only a few tasks for each one, whereas criterion reference tend to focus on clearly defined tasks. Um, when I'm designing a norm reference test, I'm really focused on items that will discriminate between individuals. So I'm really focused on, um, does this tell the difference between someone who knows and someone who doesn't, or between fine differences between people? Whereas in a criterion reference test, I'm really focused on the content of the question. So does this content really represent the domain of interest? Does this content really represent what I want students to know about this information? Um, so in norm reference tests, I tend to have lots of items of average difficulty with things that are very easy or very difficult um, eliminated. Um, whereas in the criterion reference, I'm less concerned about item difficulty. I'm really more concerned about thinking about the whole construct of, of what I'm measuring as a whole. Um, the interpretation of a norm reference test really depends upon that group. So for example, if I said you were in the 95th percentile on this test, you'd think, wow, that's great, until I told you that in reference group was kindergartners. And you're like, wow, yeah, I'm better than 95% of kindergartners. That's not so great. Or if I said you were in the second percentile, you'd be like, wow, I didn't do very well, until I told you that the reference group were, you know, Nobel Prize winning scientists. Then you'd say, well, that's not so bad, right? Um, whereas criterion reference, really the interpretation depends upon that achievement domain or that construct. So if I said you got 95% correct, it really depends upon what am I measuring. So 95% correct on first grade spelling words or 95% correct on college algebra, right? Those are two completely different things. So the way you interpret norm reference and criterion reference tests are completely different. So um, if we're talking about the FSA, so that Florida Standards Assessment, for those of you not from Florida, that's that state test. Um, do we think the Florida state test is norm referenced or criterion referenced? So in theory, the FSA is criterion referenced, right? It's really dependent upon those Florida standards, right? So it's measuring, do you know what third graders should know at the end of third grade? However, the interpretation of those Florida standards is really norm referenced. So the way that they create those cut scores for what's passing, what's not passing, what's a three, a four, and a five, was really dependent upon having a percentage of each group of students in each category. So we'd like it to be criterion referenced. It was designed to be, um, it was theorized to be criterion referenced. However, in interpretation, it's norm reference. So on a quiz, I would never ask you, is the FSA norm referenced or criterion referenced? Because it's kind of a little bit of both, which is a problem when we're talking about the interpretation of that test and how to use those data. Next, we'll talk about aptitude and achievement tests. So what's the difference between an aptitude test and an achievement test? So an aptitude test measures ability. So what a student's capable of, kind of what they're born with. An achievement test is what the students can do or what they've learned. So aptitude test is really another word for an IQ test or an intelligence test, um, the COGAT or the WISC and the Otis Linden, those are all examples of aptitude tests. So if you hear cognitive abilities, IQ, all of that is a signal for aptitude. 
um, achievement tests or what they've learned, so things like the advanced placement, AP tests, the FSAs, the end of course, the EOCs, those are all achievement tests. Most of what we do in school, again, are achievement tests. We're really mostly concerned in schools about what students have learned or what they can do. We're less concerned with aptitude. We're usually only going to do a measure of aptitude if we're trying to diagnose students with a learning disability or identify them for a gifted program. Um, we tend to talk about, um, I tend to like to think about aptitude and achievement when I'm talking about, uh, I like to think of them as height and weight. So um, we cannot, we can do very little to affect our height, right? We are either tall or short, that's all in our genes. That's a lot like aptitude. I can do very little to affect my intelligence, kind of the genes, the heredity that I was born with. However, I can do a lot to affect my weight, right? I can exercise more. I can eat more, I can affect my weight. That's a lot like achievement. I can do a lot to affect my students' achievement. I can teach them, they can learn, they can read more, they can study, they can affect their achievement. So achievements like weight, aptitudes like height. So what about the SAT? So the, the test you take to get into college, is that aptitude or achievement? So by most traditional measures, um, we would consider it an aptitude test. Traditionally, we think of SAT as kind of what a student um, is capable of in their critical thinking. However, more recently, we know that we can study for the SAT. We can take tests in um, study guides to get better at it. We can um, learn more vocabulary. We can study that math. We can get better. So it's really functioning more like an achievement test now. So again, the SAT is on that line between aptitude and achievement. And I wouldn't ask you on a quiz whether the SAT was aptitude or achievement. So the next type, next types of assessments we'll talk about are diagnostic, formative, and summative. So you guys should be pretty familiar with these terms already, um, formative and summative particularly. So formative assessments are what we do to in inform our assessments. So formative informs our assessment. When we are talking about formative assessments, we're talking about using assessments to guide our, guide our instruction. We use them to monitor our student learning, to plan our instruction. Summative assessments are when we're using assessments to evaluate our instruction. So when we use them to give a grade at the end, to evaluate our own progress or our students' progress, to give a grade, that's summative. And then diagnostic is when we're using assessments to put students in groups or to diagnose students with um, a learning difficulty or for a gifted education. So if we're going to use a reading assessment to put students into a reading groups, that would be diagnostic or for response to intervention. So the thing to remember about these classifications is that it's all about how students use the assessment, not the content of the assessment itself. So for example, if I gave students a fluency test, I could use it as diagnostic, formative, or summative. So I give them a fluency test, and I use that fluency test to put them into reading groups. It's diagnostic, right? If I use that fluency test to decide which books I'm going to use in my reading instruction, then it's formative. If I'm using that fluency test to give them a grade for their nine weeks, then it's a summative test. So the test itself um, could be used in, e in any of the three ways. It's all about how I use it. So on a quiz, you need to think about how that test is being used. So again, the SAT, how could it be used diagnostically? The SAT is used diagnostically when it's used by college admissions officers to decide who should get to go to college or who should be in the honors program, right? The SAT could be used formatively. It could be used formatively when it's being used by an SAT instruction um, prep teacher to decide what to focus on during their course. And it's used summatively by a high school to decide how well their high school is doing to prepare students for college, right? Same with the FSA, right? We use the FSA diagnostically when we put kids in RTI groups based upon their previous year's FSA scores or to decide who's in the remedial math class. We use the FSA formatively when we use those scores to decide what type of instruction to give students in class. And we use it summatively to decide um, if the student, um, how well the student did in that grade level, right? So the next type of assessments are really talking about the types of items we have in assessments. So we have dichotomously and non-dichotomously scored items. 
So the dichotomously scored items are when there's one correct response. So it's either wrong or it's right. So examples of this are true, false, multiple choice, fill in the blank, anything that could be either scored right or wrong. Non-dichotomously scored items are items that are assessed on a scale or a scoring guide. So anything that's graded with a rubric or on a math problem, if you're giving them partial credit, and essay questions are usually non-dichotomously scored, projects tend to be non-dichotomously scored. So we can think about things that are either scored right or wrong, or things that are non-dichotomously scored. Um, then we can think about constructed or selected response items. So constructed response items are when students write in their own responses, and selected responses are when students choose their response. So constructed responses are things like essays, fill in the blanks, um, short answer items, and selected responses, multiple choice, true, false, etc. So note that some constructed responses could be dichotomously scored, right? So a fill in the blank question would be a constructed response, but it would still be scored dichotomously. It's still either right or wrong. Okay, then we also have um, performance, alternative, and authentic ass assessments. So performance assessments are when students are asked to perform a meaningful task. This could be either a performance like um, a speech or a presentation, or it could also be something like a project or um, like a science fair project or a poster. Um, sometimes we call performance assessments alternative assessments, and that just means an alternative to or traditional assessment. I don't like that term because I think it's confusing, but a lot of times you'll hear administrators or principals use the term alternative assessment, so I want you to know what that means. And then a subset of performance assessments are called authentic assessments. And authentic assessments are when you're doing a performance assessment that is based upon a real world task. So not all performance assessments are authentic, but all authentic assessments are performance. So if I ask kids to create a diorama, that's performance assessment, but it's not authentic. You're never going to create a diorama in real life. But if I ask kids to create a recycling program, that's an authentic task, right? We actually kind of might do that in the real world, right? So authentic tasks tend to be really engaging for students and really meaningful when students can engage in authentic projects. And it's important to know that performance assessments um, are on a continuum. So multiple choice tests are really not uh, not performance based, right? It's very inauthentic. Um, and then short answer, maybe a little bit more essays or maybe a little more performance based. Then you have structured performance tasks, something like a lab activity in a science class where you follow the directions. Then things like projects, posters, products, um, and then finally something that's really authentic, an authentic assessment would be the most on that scale. So it's a range. Um, then I want to talk about standardized assessments. So standardized assessments, the term you're going to hear a lot, and all that means is it's something that's formal. It's in a clearly defined context with the clear administration guidelines. It has lots of structure. Um, and it's given the same way no matter what the context is. Um, and again, this is something that's on a continuum. So you have everything from if I was doing a class discussion, that would be very unstandardized. It would be the it would be a completely different discussion in every single section of my class, right? Then if I had something like a performance test, I would give everyone the same directions, but I would get a lot of different kind of products from all of my different students. Um, if I gave a classroom test, that would be the same test in all of my sections of the class, but it would be different if I went next door to the other algebra teacher and they might be giving a completely different test. Then there might be like a district level test. So everyone in my district would get the same test. Everyone in Duval County Schools would get the same algebra test, but in St. John's County they'd get a different test, right? Then we talk about standardized tests like the Florida Standards Assessment, the FSA. Everyone in Florida would get the same test. So it's the same in Duval County as it is in Miami-Dade as it is in Tallahassee, right? But the kids in Tennessee, the kids in Alaska are getting a different test. And then we have national standardized tests, um, things that are done by test publishing companies. So things like the WISC. Um, or the Iowa Test of Basic Skills. These are tests that are not done by a particular state but are published by publishing companies and they're given in really detailed ways and they're very highly standardized and that way I can rely on those results um, no matter where the test is given. So again, standardized assessments can be on this continuum.
Then we have um, these terms, we have a standardized test, and sometimes we use these terms interchangeably, standardized test, high stakes test, accountability test. And I wanna make sure that we're really being really specific when we say each of these terms. So sometimes we say we hate standardized tests, but what we really mean is we dislike high stakes tests or accountability tests. So a high stakes test is a test that is any test that has a high stakes attached to it. So something like the FSA, right, is a high stakes test. If I don't pass the FSA in fourth grade, I don't get to go on to fifth grade. That's a high stakes. But also something like the SAT or the ACT is a high stakes test. If I don't do well in the SAT, I might not go to college. That's a high stake, right? An accountability test is any test that's associated with the state accountability program. So things like the FSA um, or the, the high school EOCs, the end of course exams, those are accountability tests. Those are tied to specifically to the state laws and the National No Child Left Behind Act. So sometimes when we say we don't like standardized tests, what we really mean is we don't like accountability tests. So when we talk about these in class, I want you to be really specific about what type of test you mean. Do you mean standardized? Do you mean high stakes? Or do you mean accountability? So now I want to do a little group activity, even though we're obviously spread apart. I want you to think about some examples of each of these types of tests. So give me an example of a norm reference test. Good, so one example might be um, the an IQ test, right? Um, like the WISC. What about a criterion reference test? Good, a criterion reference test might be something like the um, ITBS or anything we give in schools. Most things we give in schools are criterion referenced. What about an aptitude test? What is an aptitude test? Good, an aptitude test is any kind of IQ test an achievement test. Good, an achievement test is mostly what we do in school, anything that measures what students know or can do. Here's a tricky one. What about a spelling pretest? Is that aptitude or achievement? A spelling pretest, even though you haven't studied for it, you could have studied for it. A spelling pretest is still achievement. It me measures something that you could learn, right? Diagnostic, formative, or summative. If I just said the SAT, is that diagnostic, formative, or summative? Could you answer that? No, right? Because the SAT could be used as a diagnostic test, as a formative test, or as a summative test. What about a standardized test? What's an example of a highly standardized test? Good, the FSA is a, is a highly standardized test. What about a dichotomously scored item? What's an example of a dichotomously scored item? Good, true, false, or multiple choice are dichotomously scored items. What about a performance assessment? What's an example of a performance assessment? Good, a project would be a performance assessment. What about an authentic assessment? Can you give me an example of an authentic assessment? Good, um, any kind of real world example? Excellent. I'll see you next week.